Hello, friends. This is Dave Hurwitz, executive editor at ClassicsToday.com, here with a story that I've never told before, but I think the time has passed when I need to worry about telling it. Uh, and I'm not going to mention any embarrassing names because I'm just far too nice for that. But it, it involves my personal PR nightmare. And it's an interesting tale, a very, very interesting story that I think I think ought to be out there so that people just get a sense of how wacko the classical music universe is. Now, at one point in my life, aside from being a critic, I was, I was involved in wanting to produce some recording projects. I mean, we all have recording projects, right? We all know that we can do it better than what the labels are doing. And as part of my, my goal to sort of popularize classical music and show that music is just music and it's great and wonderful and we should all be having a great time with it. I conceived with my dear friend who you've seen on this channel, Dr. Zerlin Meyer Eller of Munchkin, of Munich, uh, this project, Earquake. Now I've talked about this before on the channel. Some of you may even own it. It's the world's loudest classical music album on on uh, on Dean. Um, because Rayo Kilunen, who was the managing director of Ondina, I think he still is. Yeah, he still is. Of course he still is. Um, he's just a terrific guy, and it's a wonderful label, and I love them. And and we, we, we pitched this idea to him, which was to do a disc that had all kinds of really, really head-banging, loud, crazy classical music, including John Leif's Hecla. Yes, Hecla, the volcanic eruption in which I perform. That's where I've talked about this before. I'm the special guest anvil soloist on this recording. And, and, and Rayo was able to organize a concert in Helsinki where we actually performed this program. And we had an aerobic dance soloist and we did all this crazy stuff. And Life Segerstam, who is nothing if not a sport, was willing to do it. Um, and he inter interspersed some of his own stuff in here. There's a bit of one of his 475,000 symphonies, or no, Nostalgic Thoughts. Yes, there's a thing in there called that. Um, it was one, a piece of one of his symphonies in here, and which is based on like, you know, random things the orchestra does. I mean, it was, it was fun. It was a great time. Everyone had a great time, and then they recorded the concert separately. It wasn't a live recording. It was a studio recording in Finlandia Hall. And we were very, very proud of this production because it contained tons of unusual and interesting music. I mean, the list of composers, it's Hansen, Rangstrom, Cacciatore and Prokofiev, Jacob Druckmann, Revueltas, Carl Nielsen, Hina Stera, Schulhoff, Segerstam himself, uh, Bolkum, Iber, Respighi, Shostakovich, Rautavara, and the huge climax, the Jan Leif's Hecla. Hecla, yes, the volcano. And so it was It was a thrill. And it was so exciting to be involved in it. And I was so happy. And, and Zerlin was so happy. And we thought it was going to be terrific. Um, you know, they designed a wonderful, a wonderful cover here. Well, this is a different cover. This is not the original cover. The original cover was, you know, a guy from the Undine office with headphones, you know, and a boom box. And it was, anyway. And, and it came packed with earplugs here in the spine of the LP. I mean, there was, there was a real effort. A real effort to do to do do good by the concept. Was it a good concept? I don't know. You know, I, we may have been very foolish and naive in thinking that the classical music w world was ready to accept such a project, to accept our view of what classical music could be or should be, for the, at least for this particular concept. But but Rayo and and Ondine were a hundred percent behind it, and they hired a PR person in New York. And this PR person who'd worked with the label for a long time said he was, uh, this guy said he was 100% behind this project. And uh, he shall remain nameless and live in infamy. So we, we start working on how we're going to promote this project. And like so many PR people, he had many clients. And he was trying to find um, an angle, an angle to promote Earquake. And he represented, it turned out, um, a major European festival, which shall also remain nameless. Um, and that European festival was having a year devoted to its theme. You know, festivals have themes. You know, they, they, they do theme things all the time. And, and some of these themes are even dumber than any themes that, that 
that I could come up with. And this particular theme this year was the health benefits of classical music. Remember, there was that whole huge trend. I mean, what year? What year did we do this? 1997. All right, so 1997. But there was around then too. They were all that, you know, Mozart for pregnant women, and classical music is good for you, and you know, it reprograms your brain and all that. I happen to believe that music is good for you. I really do. I think it's good for your mind. It's good for you, especially music without words and music in large forms where you can, where you have to be able to conceptualize abstract pieces in, in your brain as they move through time. I think it's a whole different way of deploying your, 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 you know, mental capabilities. And so I do think it's good for you and it's good memory training and all of those things. But that's, that's, that's not the point. They were talking then about like, you know, lowering your blood pressure and curing cancer and doing, you know, all kinds of health things. And that was, that was the theme, no matter how wacky it was. And so, and so this PR guy took Undine's money and decided he was going to combine his, uh, his, his job, in other words, his, his mandate to promote earthquake with what he was doing for this festival, was, which was promoting the health benefits of classical music on behalf of this festival. Well, these two projects were completely incompatible. Say what you will about the health benefits of classical music, this was not one of them. The whole point about this is that it's as bad for you as heavy metal, if that's bad for you. It was supposed to be absolutely classical music junk food. I mean, you know me, you know, I mean, I, I know my junk food and I, I, it's not junk food in like the bad sense. It's good junk food, fun, noise, in, hysteria, things that really will, will shock you and, 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 and stimulate you. That kind of noise, that was the idea, but it was not health. This had nothing whatsoever to do with health. Zippo. Zero, it didn't matter. It didn't matter to him. He decided that he was going to promote health. Why? Because this big European festival was a much larger and more important client than little old Ondine Records and and my, you know, Soren and mine little, little, little earthquake project, this particular project. He didn't, he didn't care um, about what this meant and finding interesting ways to promote this particular project. So he decided to combine it with the health benefits of classical music. And he wanted me to do some interviews where I discussed in connection with this, the health benefits of classical music. Well, needless to say, I said, no, I'm not gonna do it because that's not what the project is and it doesn't make any sense. And, and, and we got into a huge brouhaha um, in which Ondine was stuck in the middle, and that was very unfortunate because they had done everything that they were supposed to do. I mean, they put in the money and the resources and the love and the care, and they, 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 they flew us out to Finland. I mean, they did everything that they could have done, and they hired PR, and they got PR. But there was nothing to be done for it because he was absolutely determined in the most backstabbing and scurrilous way to promote health in classical music for this festival at the expense of Earthquake. So as a result of that, the PR program that we had conceived for this whole thing and that you know, we very carefully discussed and discussed. I mean, this was not a surprise. We, we discussed it with this guy and we were there at his office and we had meetings and we went back and forth and we, you know, none of that happened. None of it happened and none of it happened. I won't say that as a result, this was not the Grammy winning success that it should have been. It probably made no difference whatsoever in retrospect, but I was so upset. Oh my God, I was upset because you know, when you have, it's your project, it's your baby, you have a vision for it. And you know that that vision is correct to the extent that at least it's consistent with what the project is. It's not something else, it's not whatever. And you see somebody take a hold of it and go and screw around with it and basically basically just sideline everything that you discussed and agreed to. I mean, we had a program that we agreed to um, that was consistent with what we'd originally come up with. So all that went down the crapper and I was terribly, terribly upset. So I was, I was, I was visiting my parents one weekend 
And I was just in a funk about this whole thing because I really, really thought that this was a fun project, which had it been promoted correctly, um, or at least somewhat consistently with what we originally designed, um, could have had a modicum of success. I don't know, maybe it did. I don't know. I don't know anything about it, frankly, in terms of marketing and sales. But anyway, um, so I went home and I was talking to my father and my father looked, so I was sort of down in the dumps and he said, what's the matter? And I explained to him this whole situation. And I said that I really felt betrayed by this guy who I'd known for, for many, many years, many years, and, 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 and had done things, you know, wrote, written about things that he was promoting and who I, I felt I had a reasonable working relationship with. And my father just said, oh, ignore him. He's just an asshole, which is, you know, uh, wisdom from someone of older years than I. And I said to my father, but dad, you don't get it. He was a friend. I it wasn't just a, someone I, I met from somebody. He was a friend. I knew him. We, we got along. And my father, who was nothing if not fatalistic and cynical about the ways of the world, looked at me and said, no, you don't get it. Most of your friends are assholes, too. They just haven't had an opportunity to prove it to you. I said to him, so this is what I have to look forward to <laughs> as, I, as I go through life. He said, probably something like that. And that was the end of that conversation. But, but you know, uh, perversely, it actually made me feel much better because it lowered my expectations. You know, at that point, I still had a vestige of idealism, uh, you know, left about, you know, what what classical music could be and, you know, how I saw it and, and that that could be a, uh, a good thing, a good thing and an, and an enjoyable thing for a wide range of people. And I still believe that, by the way, and that's what this channel is, of course. This is, this is classical music hopefully presented in a way which is not part of that usual sort of snooty, high-end castor oil approach. Take this, it's good for you. It, even if it tastes terrible, it's good for you. No, it's just good for you, whatever way it comes out and whatever you happen to enjoy or want to enjoy. I was profoundly upset that I felt that um, the industry, as represented by this guy, it was quite typical of what was going on in PR circles at the time, um, had such a rigid view of what classical music had to be. And that was, of course, connected to the whole concept of high culture and, and sublimity and transcendental universal greatness and all of that garbage that, that we all have to deal with um, in, in, in you know, dealing with, with the great works of, of, our, of our heritage, of our cultural heritage. But I wanted to share this story with you. I don't want to drone on forever, but I wanted to share this with you because it really was an education. It was one of those educational experiences, and there were many. Um, over the years, and you've heard quite a few of them, you know, talking about the awards and other things that I've done that really, really told me that our view of classical music is so, so rigid and so uh, unimaginative and, 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 and so lacking in, in, in adventure. And it's not the kind of adventure where, you know, you work within these parameters of total snobbism and, and you know, do something, you know, it, trivially different and make ridiculous claims for it. I mean, it, it's music that deserves to be done at, to join the, the fraternity of music more generally um, so that people can experience it and hear it and make up their own minds about it. That's, that's, that's my thing. I'm still waiting for somebody to do a hip hop version of Die Winterreise. I think it would be amazing, especially Liermann. Wow, could that be a hip hop number? Because you sample, you sample the little refrain, do 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 do, right? And, oh God, there's so much that we could do with this stuff. So much fun to be had with it, and I hope we can do a lot more as we continue over the uh, next few years. But that's the tale. So keep on listening, friends. Thanks for listening, and take care.